All right, you can turn in your King James Bible to the book of Colossians. This week we're going to be talking about pre-trib rapture scriptures in the book of Colossians. And again, answering the thing of people saying there are no scriptures that prove the rapture will happen for Christians before this tribulation, false term, but uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week, as it's properly called in the Bible. Uh, they say there are no scriptures to prove the rapture happens beforehand. I beg to differ. We're going to show you quite a few today in the book of Colossians. We're going to start out here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, if you have an NIV or some of these other satanic new versions that come from the Vatican, and they do, by the way, uh, you can study the thing. The Alexandrian text has been used by the Vatican down through the centuries, the whole way back, you know, to the founding of the Vatican, the, the Roman Catholic system. They've used Alexandrian Egyptian Greek texts, a very few of them. Okay, they're big, two big codices, Codex B and the left, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They're the ones that they use. And they've been using them for centuries. And that's what the new versions are based upon. Okay, not my opinion. Documented fact. And they take out through his blood there in verse 14. Classy. And they say, but we've left it someplace else. You can get that doctrine somewhere else. You know, it's kind of like some guy comes up and mugs you and he puts a gun on you and he says, give me your money. And, he, and you give him your wallet and, and he says, okay. He pulls out all the cash and gives you your wallet back and, and it gives you a quarter. And you say, hey, he robbed me. And he said, no, I didn't rob you. I left you a quarter, you know. That's what these new versions do. Oh, we, we didn't take the blood completely out. Yeah, we took it out of Colossians 1.14, but uh, it's in other places. <laughs> Don't use the new versions. If you speak English, use the King James Bible. And if you speak other languages, then you find the Bible in your language, your particular language that lines up with this King James Bible that's based upon the received text which is Syrian Greek text, it's not the Egyptian, and then you use that Bible, and you defend that Bible. But look here, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Again, it's very interesting there. Um, we are light, we are the light of the world. That's true. But we also have an inheritance that's coming in that millennial kingdom, and the light, the sunlight in that time period is going to be seven times brighter than it currently is. And there was a, I saw somebody in the comments said, well, how would things work then if the sunlight's going to be seven times more powerful? Wouldn't that burn everything up? And one of you commented, and I thought it was great, you said, well, it doesn't say the heat is seven times greater. It says the light is seven times greater. So, yeah, don't know exactly how that's all going to work out, but the Lord will take care of that stuff. But we have the inheritance of the saints in light. Interesting. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. When is the ultimate time of the power of darkness going to happen? Uh, that would be in the time of Jacob's trouble. When Satan himself is going to be physically manifested in the body of the Antichrist. You know, ruling and reigning. And anybody that worships him and, and takes the mark goes to hell, guaranteed. I think that that would be called the power of darkness there, just slightly, okay? The worst time period in the history, in all of recorded history, is that time of Jacob's trouble, God's wrath coming down and everything else. And it says there, verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? But I like the second part, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do the original autographs, are they um, better or inferior to the translation? So what are, you, what are you talking about Bible version issue? Well, yeah, that too. But, but think about this as a Christian. Us, as our sinful lost person, that's the original. Okay? It's what God created. We're the original. Now you get saved and you get translated. You say, what's translation mean? Translation means going from point A 
to point B. Going from one, from here to there. <laughs> now, when you become a new creature in Christ Jesus, is that translation, the translated final product there, so to speak, is it better or worse than what you once were? Uh, better. Okay. Is this King James Bible better or worse than the original autographs? Is it superior? Is the translation superior? Yes. You know why? Because I'm holding it in my hands. Where are the original autographs? Where, is the, where was there ever a book of the original autographs in one volume? And by the way, even if you could compile such a thing, let's say the Vatican would try to do it, they can't. Why? Moses destroyed the original autographs of the Ten Commandments. Those tables, those stone tables, he comes down and he sees what they're doing and he goes, boom, like that, and he smashes them. So the original autographs are lost. <laughs> and I say that because these new version scholars, will they, they play up this whole thing of the original autographs. Oh, it's so the originals, the originals, the originals. Don't waste time with the originals. The translation is superior. Interesting. And it's true for the Bible. It's also true for us. You say, well, this translation there, that happens, that's the rapture. That's when we get, we're translated, we're called up. Well, that's true. That's the final, you know, our salvation. The final part of our salvation is that final translation where we go from the earth, corruptible, to become incorruptible. That is true. But I'm going to show you today that this translation has already partly happened. I'll show you that. Next, go to... Uh, Actually, you know what? I'm going to go to a scripture here quick. I didn't see I had this written down. Keep your hand there in Colossians chapter 1 and go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I thought this was later in the study, but no, it's right here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. I'm talking about the translation. It says here, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace our by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the rich, exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Did you know that you are seated together in heavenly places right now in Christ Jesus? Really something, isn't it? So the translation there, when you get saved, you are translated. Now, the final part of that is going to be at the rapture when we go up. But uh, you're already seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, how on earth could Jesus open up the seals and release judgment on the earth when part of his body's down there? Kind of weird, isn't it? But let's continue. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Another uh, little proof of the rapture here. It says here, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, the blood that the new versions took out, verse 14. And again, peace. As you've, If you've seen the other studies, you know what I'm talking about here. Revelation 6, verse 4 says, Peace is taken from the earth when the red horse rider is unleashed. But we have peace as Christians. But we don't have peace in Revelation 6, 4 because peace is taken from the earth. <laughs> Such a warped system, this post-rib stuff. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Huh. The reoccurring theme over and over and over and over through all these scriptures that prove the rapture. I've talked about it before. You can watch the other studies. I'm not going to go through all the scriptures again. But the whole thing is... The redemption of the purchased possession that's mentioned, being mentioned here. Look at this. Whether they be things in earth, we which are alive and remain, or things in heaven, the dead in Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Do you understand? Paul never mentions a rapture. <laughs> How can you not see this? It's right there. 
over and over and over and over and over again. And you say, but but see, you know, it's 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 the second coming. It's 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 Christians go through the tribulation. Okay, then. Please show me anywhere in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21, the classic passages about the second coming, about going through this tribulation, using their terms. Please show me where dead saints are coming up. Two in the field, the one's taken, the other's left. Two men in one bed, the one's taken, the other left. Two women grinding at the mill, the one's taken, the other left. Excuse me? Where are the dead saints at? Not even close. And what you see in the book of John is pointed towards Christians. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. So many tie-ins. But you see, if you can't handle a lot of Scripture, if you don't look at the Scriptures and rightly divide them, well, then this stuff is too much for you. And you just get lazy and you go, the whole Bible is for me. Everything. Genesis to Revelation, it's all for me. Uh, there's no right division. There's no dispensational teaching. Just the whole thing. Just... It's all for me. Lazy people, these post-tribbers. Let's go now to Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. Let's read these verses. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea. Hmm. You do an interesting study of types and things like that and uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 it ends with the church of Laodicea they're lukewarm neither cold nor hot you know they're increased with goods and things like that many people try to say that that's the you know it's the seven churches picture seven periods in in church history and it ends with the very lukewarm carnal church at the very end the falling away the great falling away and I think that that's very true um, and there's some issues with some of that stuff, but you know, I I've taught it, and I think it's in, you know, as far as instruction and righteousness, I think it's very good. So, he's for writing here to them at Laodicea. So we would do well to listen to this. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, hmm, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Huh. You know, a lot of you have not seen my face in the flesh. You see me in video. Praise the Lord. Great. I've written back and forth with a lot of you. That's wonderful. But a lot of you haven't seen my face in the flesh. But you will one day. And I'll see your faces in the flesh too. Looking forward to that. Verse 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words, like post-tribbers do. You know, they entice you by saying, you know, it's going to be after the tribulation. The Bible's crystal clear, it's after the tribulation, and you're going to go through it, and all this other stuff. John Nelson Darby was the first to teach the rapture, and blah, 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 blah. What should I do? Well, here I have all these nice survival goodies for you to buy. They're beguiling you with enticing words. Verse 5, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Very true. Joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Boy, I can relate to that. I, can, I, have, I am living this verse. Okay? I am absent in the flesh. We don't get the fellowship face to face right now. A lot of you online. We're not there face to face. I'm not able to just come and, and have you ask me questions face to face and I can talk to you and think we're not there. Yet I am with you in the spirit. Yeah. We're going through similar things. We feel similar things. We're getting vexed by the filthy conversation of the wicked. Uh it's there. Joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. I love it when I see people asking questions in the comments. And I don't even have to do anything. My brothers and sisters in Christ come in and they go, I can answer that. Here's a study that Brother Brian did or, uh, you know, here's this or here's that. And, hey, I, you know, I see people and they say, you know, please pray for me. I'm really having a hard time. And I see a bunch of you commenting and saying, yeah, we'll pray for you. You know, uh, things like that. It's a, a great joy to me there. Joying and beholding your order. Yeah. It's, it's, it brings me wonderful joy to see those of you out there really standing strong. It's great. And the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. 
I really love to see it. Verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Okay, now let me just stop right there for a minute. You know, you say, well, again, how does this prove a pre trib rapture? Where's the instructions to prepare? Where's the instructions to survive? Where's, you know, enduring to the end, not taking the mark and all this stuff? I mean, if Paul, if, if, if there is such a thing as the body of Christ going into the time of Jacob's trouble, both Jews and Gentiles, we, the, the Christians, Paul never mentions it. Paul never mentions, hey, when the blood, when the water turns to blood, I'll tell you what, this is the way that you're going to have to, to handle that situation. Hey, when the, the Antichrist steps up and he does such as... Why does Paul never give these instructions? I mean, if we're going to go into that time period, shouldn't he have said something about it? I mean, it's another one of those big problems that the post-tribbers just don't like to talk about very much. But let's, here we're going to see some instruction for somebody can, how they can mess you up as a Christian. Look at this, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Spoil you? Well, no, Paul. You see, if people, you know, since the body of Christ is going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, those that take the mark are going to go to hell. They're going to lose their salvation. So why would he just say spoil? Uh, because the Christians don't go into the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, that's why he's only warning and saying, if you get messed up in philosophical debating and meandering and all this other stuff, it's going to spoil you. You're going to be spoiled rotten. <laughs> You're going to stink as a Christian. Ugh, I don't want to be around him. Okay, there's a lot of brethren that are like that right now. A lot of this easy believism stuff, you look at some of the brethren, they've been through repentance to salvation, but they get messed up with philosophy. They start coming and saying, well, but what if a man did such and such sin, and, and yet he had a profession of faith, but yet there's a, a bit, 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 they depart from the simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of the gospel. You're a sinner. God's angry with those sins. You get saved, obviously, you're going to be turning from those sins. It might take you years and years and years, but you're going to be turning from those sins. And if you don't, you're going to be chastised of the Lord. You're going to be punished for it. There's a knowledge of sin there. There's a knowledge I have to change these ways. Not you change the ways and then you get saved. That is heresy. You change because you are saved. The Holy Spirit comes in. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But these people that argue about this, they've been spoiled through philosophy. They just nitpick every single little thing that you say, trying to find any kind of little thing that they can just get you on and just... And that's all they do. They're spoiled through philosophy. But let's continue here. Verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Talking about Christ. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in him. No, Paul... You, Paul must be reading a Schofield reference Bible or something. How could Christians be complete in Jesus Christ when we have to not take the mark of the beast and endure to the end to be saved? You see the problem this post-trib stuff comes up with? It just, it just makes a total wreck of the Pauline epistles. It just messes up the Bible. We as Christians are complete in Jesus Christ. We are sealed until the day of redemption. I don't have to worry about taking the mark. I won't be here for it. I'm complete in Jesus Christ. Go to chapter... Uh, let's see here. No, sorry, we're still in the same chapter. Verse 11. It says here, In whom also ye are circ circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Even take the mark of the beast? No, it's not mentioned because we're not going to be here for it. 
Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You say, what is this all about? Okay, verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with a circum circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And then it talks about the operation there in the next verse. In the Old Testament, you'll see the statement, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. If you touch something, you touch a dead body, you touch a this or you touch, you'll be unclean. You have to go, you have to offer the sacrifice, you know, and, the, and things and be washed and so many times and whatever else, you'll be unclean. Why? The soul and the flesh were tied together back in the Old Testament. Here in the New Testament, there's a circumcision, or there's a, there's a, uh, uh, well, circumcision made an operation there where the soul and the flesh are cut separate. So the things that you do in the flesh, if you go out and you touch things that are called unclean, it's not going to affect your soul anymore. Why? You've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Those sins are forgiven. All your trespasses are forgiven. And again, you know, say, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not saved, but I think I'm going to have a good chance of uh, getting into heaven. My good works will be outweighed. You, uh, you got a problem, okay? You want to get somebody that pays for all of your sins, and you don't have to try to pay for them yourself. That's very important. But you see there, this thing of, our flesh and our soul are split. And all of our sins are forgiven as a result of that. But how does that work if you go into the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, show me where it says a man can take the mark and still go to heaven. And all these post-trippers are coming out now and saying that. Well, you know, I think it might be possible. I think it might be possible. The Bible's crystal clear. If any man takes the mark... He goes to hell. And you say, what? but it's take the mark and, and worship the beast. You know, that's that's uh, two different things. Maybe you could take the mark and not worship the beast. It's all going to be part of the same system. Okay, that's not going to be optional. Well, yes, you can take the mark, but you don't have to worship the beast. It's all part of the same system. It's always said in the same context. You know, it doesn't work, brethren. These people out there that say, well, I think that you can do both and things. I think that you could, uh, or that you could do, not, not not do both, but I think you can take the mark and just not worship the beast and you you might be okay. And Watch out for that. The Bible's crystal clear on this issue. But let's go to, uh, look at verse 16 here. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Okay, is that true for a Christian? Yeah, absolutely. Romans chapter 13, verse 9, Paul lists ten commandments, you know, some of the ten commandments. He doesn't bring up the Sabbath day. You don't have to keep the Sabbath day today. Unless you're a Seventh-day Adventist cultist, then you have to keep it. At least pretend to keep it. You know, yeah, right, they don't. But, uh, Keep your hand there in Colossians chapter 2 and go back to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to show you the significance of this statement that no man is supposed to judge you in relation to the Sabbath day. Matthew chapter 24 verse 20 says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Why? You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day. Um... If New Testament Christians are in Matthew 24, what are they doing keeping the Sabbath day? When Paul does not say anything about keeping the Sabbath day? Kind of negligent of Paul there, isn't it? You know? No, it's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Matthew 24 is not written to Christians. It's written to Jews. Jews for the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel's 70th week. Seventy weeks are determined upon my people, Israel. Read about that in the book of Daniel. <laughs> Do you get it yet? <laughs> Some of these post-tribbers, I'll tell you what. Let, let's continue. 
In Revelation 14, verse 12, I have it in my notes here. You can read that. It talks about keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus. So the commandments are coming back in the time of Jacob's trouble. But let's continue. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Hmm. Is that true for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble? No. No. They do have to think about earthly things. They do have to realize, I'm going to have to endure to the end. I'm going to have to keep the Sabbath day. I'm going to have to do all these things in that time. Not so for today. And again, if you are looking for Jesus Christ to take the bride of Christ out of here, how are you going to spend your time? Witnessing, winning souls. You know, all this stuff here is going to be left behind. Everything. Unless you're a post-tribber. Then you got to get that survival built, that uh, survivor, survival bunker, excuse me, survival bunker built. You better get to work. You got to endure to the end. You can't take the mark. You can't this, you can't that. <laughs> I mean, these studies are not rocket science, brethren. I mean, this stuff is just, it's right there. I mean, people, you know, oh, it's a very difficult issue. Not really. I mean, you can make it difficult. You can make all this, the, the pre-trib versus post-trib rapture. You can get into these big debates and make it really complicated. But if you understand the basics of Scripture, it's really not that tough to understand. The body of Christ is leaving before that time comes. That's what triggers the time. Okay? We are the ones that are hindering the Antichrist from showing up. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. We go up. Bye-bye. Now the Lord's wrath can come out. Verse 4, Colossians chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What is that? It's the rapture. When he appears... To the body of Christ, we're going to go up there and appear with him in glory. It's going to be the redemption of the purchased possession. Under the praise of his glory, it talks about in other places. That's going to be the time. We're going to get there and we're going to look around. And we're going to see each other. And then we're going to see Jesus for the very first time. And what do you think we're going to do at that point in time? Walking around, hey, brother, hey, sister, hey, hey. Oh, man, it's finally good to meet you. And here comes Jesus, shows up, and it's like, hey, just hold on a second over there. We'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> no, he's going to get the glory. We're probably going to go down, bow down before him. The whole body of Christ just turn and bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ to the praise of his glory. Except if you go through the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> then some of the body of Christ might make it. Some might take the mark and you know, be damned for eternity. Post-tribism post is a circus without a tent. Crazy. Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, Scythian, uh, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Talking about Christians, the body of Christ. Uh, but how does that work when you read Revelation chapter 7, where you have 144,000 sealed Jews, and then after that a great multitude from every kindred, tongue, people, nation? But I thought that we're all one in Christ. I thought there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles in the body of Christ. And we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, as we read back there in verse 14, we're cleansed by his blood. But in that Revelation chapter 7, that great multitude, they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Works. Oh, he's preaching a different gospel. No, not for today. But in that time period that's coming, yes, the gospel does change a little bit. It's still faith in Jesus Christ. But now you can't take the mark. Now there are some commandments that come in there. These post-tribbers just sit around, oh, I just think that that's heresy. I just think it's heresy. 
Oh, well, you're not looking at it. You're not considering these things. Just ridiculous. But uh, Colossians 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to, that, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful. I mean, there are no clear scriptures to prove a preacher about it. As I'm going through these studies, I mean, I'm sure that you're seeing it out there too. You're just like, there are so many. There are so many scriptures that are, that are just clearly for Christians and cannot be for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, what do you do with that? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. It can't. He takes peace from the earth in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. You're down there on the earth. You're knowing, hey, God is the one that just unleashed this war on us. How does that work if Christians are in that time period? Part of the body of Christ is being, you know, in heaven, the dead in Christ, but the living that are down there on the earth, they're getting just, just pummeled by the Lord. How can that be peaceful? To the which also ye are called in one body. How does that line up with Revelation chapter 7? It doesn't. That's why I'm saying it's just like it's this, this whole debate is not even necessary with these post-tribbers. I mean, I've been dealing with post-tribbers. That's, that's the oldest argument that I've fought for. You know, even before the Bible version issue, uh, is this whole thing of pre versus post trib rapture, and it's just like I get to a point where I'm going, okay, I've seen some people that they have some arguments, and they'll say it's not really arguments; it's more like questions, and they'll ask some questions, and I and I give them the scriptures and things, and I I pose the counter arguments to them, and that, that clearly refute their position, and they'll say, oh wow, you know that's true, okay, I see what you're saying, and they change. Other ones, it's just a spirit of pride, and they're just like, you're wrong, you're, you're crazy, you're this, you're that. Uh, the Bible clearly says after the tribulation. <laughs> and, I, you know, and I can tell by their comments, they're not even watching my videos. So as I said, way back in the Roman study, I'm done with post-tribbers. If you are a post-trib heretic, you're going to get deleted. Not somebody who's newly saved and just starting to get led astray by this post-trib stuff. They can draw you in. They can beguile you with enticing words, you know. They can draw you in. They can spoil you with their warped philosophies. But if you are in this movement and you are prideful and you will not listen to the arguments presented herein, you're just a false prophet. You're here to lead other people astray and pose questions to people that are trying to be groundly, you know, firmly grounded in the things of Scripture and the things of the Lord. Bye-bye. You're going away. Just as simple as that. I'm not going to waste my time on people that uh, answer matters before they hear it. But let's continue. Colossians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Okay, what is the, what is the condition before the rapture? I think this is a good uh, way to look at things here. Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, uh, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye, have re ye received commandments, if he uh, come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, you might not have seen that verse before, but there are two Jesuses, at least mentioned in the Bible. Here's another one of them. Not the one that died for your sins, but just a disciple. You know, basically a worker for the Lord. Uh, Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Hmm. And I want you to think about this. Verse 7. Tychicus. Verse 9. Onesimus. Verse 10, Aristarchus and Marcus. And verse 11, Jesus, which is called Justice. These only are my fellow workers. Five people? Oh, excuse me. Um, are you saved? Yes, I'm saved. Oh, where do you fellowship at? Well, I fellowship at home. We worship the Lord at home. Uh, we watch sermons online and and things, and uh, right back and forth with some of the brethren. Oh, but no, no, but I mean real fellowship at a church building. Where do you fellowship at a church building? 
well, actually, church buildings are not have no basis in the Scripture. Oh, but you have to fellowship with people. The Bible says that you're not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. If you don't have a large group that you fellowship with, you're just pond scum. Uh, no. <laughs> the Apostle Paul had five fellow workers. Uh, as in the days of Noah, so too shall be in the days of the, before the coming of the Son of Man. How many people did Noah get saved? Seven members of his own family? Hmm. Don't feel ashamed, brethren, because you don't have many people that you fellowship with. The more you stand for the Lord, the more you're going to be standing alone. Paul wrote about it. This is back in the first century, brethren. <laughs> first century. Not in the time of the great falling away. Not in the time when there will be, you know, the, the time when many will depart from the faith and things and, and people will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables and all this stuff. We're living in the worst time period ever in church history. Don't feel bad because you don't have many people to fellowship with and because your circle of fellow workers is very small. I think a lot of you out there, you probably know more people, more than five people that are you would consider a fellow worker. People that you fellowship with here on this channel, down in the comments, or you email back and forth, or you write. I know that some of you even call each other and things. You do Skype conversations, or you call each other on the phone just to encourage each other. Don't feel bad about that. Don't feel like you're a second-rate Christian because you talk to some social light that goes to a Babel building someplace. They can make you feel like you're stupid or some kind of, you know, whatever. Don't even think about it. Paul had five people that he called his fellow workers. And I think kind of in a way, it's, it's kind of a, a prophetic utterance there. Paul, in this, you know, letter to the Colossians, he's telling people, hey, read this to the people in Laodicea. Hmm. Kind of symbolizing the church period where we're currently at. The Laodicean time period there where they're neither cold nor hot, they're lukewarm, they're increased with goods and have need of nothing. Very interesting. Check this out. Go down to verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. Hmm. You say, well, brother, the, the Bible is very clear. It's just speaking of a local church back in the first century. We cannot spiritualize this or, or take this as symbolical or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and yet those same people will spiritualize and make symbolic things, other parts in the Bible that are supposed to be literal. And I do believe that there is a literal application there. I do believe that there was a place called Laodicea where there were, you know, this guy here, you know, and Nymphus and the church which was in his house. Nymphus had a house in Laodicea and they met there. Okay, sure, literal. But I do also believe it's symbolical. I believe that what Paul is writing here, he's symbolically showing that there's going to come a time period where the believers are going to be like those described as the church of Laodicea. They're not cold. They're not cold. They're not hot. They're lukewarm about things. Yeah. And they're meeting in their homes. Let me show you. Keep your hand there. In uh, Colossians chapter 4. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Just to read this here, just to kind of conclude this study. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, 
and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Good description of modern day Christians. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You know, there's a lot of people that profess to be Christians and they left that part out of their salvation. They never came to God in a repentant state. And that's why when you convict them of sin, when you say, hey, what you're doing is wrong, they won't repent. They will not turn from their sins. They pridefully go on and they say, I'm a Christian. How dare you judge me? Who are you to judge me? I'm a Christian. Yes, yeah, so what if I watch Hollywood movies? And so what if I have no conviction over what, listening to rock music and watching sports on television and doing all kinds of other things like that and occasionally doing you know other sins? Uh, who are you to judge me? I believe that Jesus died for my sins. I'm a Christian. Did you run into one of those? Mm -hmm. And I've taught this thing for years and I'll continue to teach it. I believe that there are people, when the Bible says here in... Um, Verse 16, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I believe that there are going to be people that are literally spewed out at the rapture. They have the appearance of being a Christian. But you see, if I spew something out of my mouth, the Bible word for vomit, God's very blunt and uh, brutally honest sometimes, actually all the time, but, uh, you know, he's sarcastic. This is a sarcastic reference to what the Lord's saying. He says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You make me so sick. And you look at this stuff like this Hillsong Church and a lot of this other modern professing Christianity, those people are disgusting. And we can only see their actions. We can't read their thoughts. God knows their thoughts. Can you imagine how much more sick He is of them? But guess what's going to happen at the rapture? They have the appearance of being Christians. They profess to be Christians. They'll talk about Jesus dying on the cross for their sins, but all they are is foreign matter in the body of Christ. They're food in his stomach. I mean, what a, what a beautiful picture. You get the Lord of heaven, the Lord of glory, and he's up there and he goes, come up hither. <laughs> like that. <laughs> the body goes up, the puke, modern Christians stay down. That's a nice picture for you. But you see there in verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Again, this easy believism thing. Oh, don't worry about it. If you've, As long as you believe in Jesus, that's all that it is. Just, just belief. Just a simple belief. Just pray a prayer you're in. Boom, you're done. Um, no, you need to be zealous. And you need to repent. You need to seriously think about your salvation. It's not some flippant little thing that you do and you just go, okay, I'm done. All right, now I'll go back to the world and do whatever I feel like doing. Uh-uh, no. You better make sure that you are saved. There's nothing more important than that. Let's continue. Verse 20, here in Revelation chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, and he with me. Have you done that? I have. If you're saved, you have. There's been a time when the Lord has said, I want to deal with you one-on-one. -on -one. Well, the door's, I just heard somebody at the door, i got to go get that. And you go and you open it up and the Lord says, how about it? You want to know me personally? I will come in and we'll have supper together. Wow. Hmm. Pretty interesting when you think about it. Do you have that close relationship with the Lord? Let me just give you a little verse of encouragement here, brethren. For those of you out there that are in this same time period as me, of course, if you're watching, you are. <laughs> but uh, verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Hmm. So the last time period 
this lukewarm Laodicean church period, uh, definitely I believe it's there as instruction in righteousness. Absolutely. And in this time period, if you overcome, you're going to have a greater reward than any of the other time periods in Christian history. You stand against the wickedness of this age and this time, you're going to have great rewards in heaven. You know, there's a lot of things that can get very discouraging, but I'll tell you what, occasionally we just need to read verses like that and just say, you know what? Praise the Lord that I've been able to overcome this. Don't get prideful. Don't get uh, high-minded or anything like that. No, no. You're still an old sinner saved by grace. Sure, absolutely. But be encouraged. If you are a King James Bible-believing Christian that doesn't fall for the modern church system and you've gotten out of the Babel building thing and you've said, you know what, there are no church buildings in Scripture. I'm not going to go to these places. They're social clubs. They're, they're you know, you, you get into this double-minded man thing of, of acting a certain way when you're in church and then you act another way when you're not in church. No, you're in church all the time. And you see, when you come out of that whole system, when you come out of this wickedness, that Laodicean time period, you're no longer just this lukewarm, well, I don't want to judge. I don't want to say if it's good or bad. I think it depends on the person and on their feelings. And the, No, 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 no. You say, the Bible says it. I believe it. Thus saith the Lord, I believe the book. And I'll stand by this book no matter what it costs me. You're no longer lukewarm. You're now on fire for the Lord. And, you know, I believe that there are some people that are saved out there that have gone through the whole organized religion thing and they just get so fed up and they're just like, you know what? I'm just, I don't even care anymore. You know what? I'm just going to go out. I'm going to live out in the wilderness someplace. And I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing. And I don't even care. What are they? They're cold. But yet God would rather have them be like that than be lukewarm pretending that they're saved and putting on a little show and a little act and going to their church and acting nice and everything else, that makes God sick. That makes Him very sick. I believe that the church age is going to end with those that are truly saved getting that knock at the door and the Lord saying, how about it? You want that personal relationship with me? Let's go back to your house. The Lord doesn't say... Hey, let's, let's, uh, let's go out on the town. Let's go to the fanciest restaurant in town. No, he says, I want to come to your house. I want to know you personally. I want to sit down with you and sup with you. Will you invite me into your home? Will you worship with me? Something to think about. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I thank you, Lord, that we do have the promise that we can know you personally. Uh, you're not some untouchable uh, head of some religious system someplace that we have a special thing we need to go to and, and uh, we never actually even get to see you or something like this. Uh, we just get to see people that work for you or something. No, we can have a personal relationship with you. Uh, you loved us enough to die for us and, and to give us a new life in Christ Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone out there listening to this that they don't know you personally like that and they're relying on their religion to uh, maybe someday possibly get to heaven, I pray, Lord, that they would repent of that and that they would come to you and seek you. And um, I just really do pray for that, Lord. And for those Christians out there that are standing for your word and holding fast, I just pray, Lord, that they would continue to um, not give in to this world, that they would not become lukewarm, but just hold on, Lord, and uh, overcome these wicked days that we live in. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that's going to be Colossians. I think we have, what, six more books to do after this. Uh, really, really, really a neat uh, study that the Lord you know, kind of put me on here. It's, I'm learning things. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's neat when you study the Word of God. I'm glad I can preach it to people, and, they, and you learn through me and through the Word. Uh, but I learn, too. Um, a lot of these scriptures I would have never even used. I would have never brought them up to prove a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble. But they're just right there. They're crystal clear. We have such great promises as Christians today. Um, man, if you're not saved, <laughs> what are you waiting for? I mean, good night.
So I want to go into the Tom Jacobs trouble and see what it's like. <laughs> You're crazy. You are absolutely nuts if you are lost and waiting to see the rapture happen and then you'll get saved. You better forget whatever you're holding on to here on this earth. Forget whatever people you don't want to offend and whatever. And you better get saved quickly. So that is going to be it. Please keep us in your prayers. And we thank you very much for watching.